hate it when I'm late. I'm always running late behind. You know what? I don't care if they don't like my sermon. I don't, I'm, try, I'm working for Jesus. I don't work for these people. I don't care what they think. I'm trying to get this stuff done. Okay. You know, people are ungrateful. They don't appreciate anything that you do. Just like them kids. I work hard for them kids. Talk about I don't say I love you enough. I act like you ate every day. I told you I loved you. What you mean? Look, okay, so got to get this stuff going. And then my wife, oh, man, I should have oh, I called my wife again this morning. Oh, man, I just got so much on my mind. I got, she, she's going to be disappointed. I got so many things I'm trying to juggle. And I don't know. I can't put this one down. I'll keep this one here. If I could just get to church this morning and just make them think that everything is okay, it'll be all right. Good morning, family. You ever been grateful people don't know everything you're thinking? We wandering around with all this stuff in our heads. All these thoughts and worries. All this stuff that keeps playing itself in our mind and we can't seem to shake it and it, it affects everything about us. We carry it around like luggage. It's always there. It always affects us. You know, some of it, it just gets heavy and burdensome. But it seems like we don't know how to put it down. Matter of fact, some of it we're rather attached to. I don't even know how to get through this life without my luggage. Matter of fact, some of it I keep boxed up so in case I get a new job or move to another town, it goes right with me. But I wonder what life would be like. Is there ever a possibility of this life? without it. I want to talk about that this morning. Because I, I think baggage is our biggest problem. Whenever I do counseling, premarital counseling, uh, just life counseling, anytime I get a chance to talk to somebody to encourage them, we're not really talking about what just happened yesterday. We're, we're hardly ever talking about the thing that they think they're upset about. What we're talking about is baggage. So as we're in this third week of our series talking about living the best you yet, ever, your best life ever, we, we can't get a different life, we can't get a better life without talking about the baggage. And so this week, I'm going to try to share some things from the Word of God that talks about freedom. Freedom from that mess and the junk and the lies and the tapes playing in our head that are killing us. Today's message is simply called, Free Your Mind. Bow with me, please. Father, we are here this morning. And it doesn't matter how dressed up we are, how good we smell, how many hallelujahs and bless yous we say. Father, we are broken vessels. But we are here because we know that as the old song says there is still a balm in Gilead <laughs> there is still a place for hurt and wounded souls to go to be healed so God today as we gather around your word send your angels to protect us and guide us and remind us oh, that you are here 
and that your love for us is so amazing. God, help us to release our past and our hurts and our pain that we may live fully and freely into the lives that you have designed for us. I pray these things trusting in the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's children said amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Um, I want to unpack this topic about freeing your mind. So I'm going to read our scripture for this morning. Uh, again, if you're able, I'd ask you to stand. I know we already pray, but I want us to always begin with the word of God and honoring the power and the transformation that comes from the word of God. So if you're able, if you would stand with me, I'm going to read from John chapter 8, uh, verses 31 through 36, uh, skipping verse 33. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Hear, hear the word of the Lord. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son or daughter belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. So my little dramatic entrance this morning was to try to give us a picture of the emotional baggage that we carry around. And, and I want us to, to acknowledge that we all have this baggage in our lives. It is, Im it is impossible to live in this fallen and broken world and not pick up some scars and some bumps along the way. And a lot of it goes back to our childhood before we had any real control over the circumstances or environments of our life. Many of us have been victims of abuses poured on us by the people that we knew and even depended and, and, and loved the most. If not, we've had people at all stages of life who didn't respect us, who didn't, who didn't care about us, who didn't have our best interest at heart, and we have been wounded in this fallen world. And so I want us all to just acknowledge that and, and give that reality some space. And, and, and brothers, I actually want to encourage us a little bit because we like to, hey, ain't no, I ain't got no emotions, I'm a man. No, you got issues. <laughs> we got men got issues too. We got as much baggage as our sisters. And so I, I want us to just kind of start off with this place. Let, let me give you a definition that I'm working from for emotional baggage. Uh, here's what it is. The feelings that you have about your past and the things that have happened to you, which often have a negative effect, and what's missing is on your present and future behavior and attitudes. Here's the point. Your future and even this moment right now, your present moment right now, is being impacted by the junk that we have in our past. It's still working itself out. It's still having ripple effects. It still affects how I look at people and how I engage with people and how close I let people and, and how much I expose my weaknesses to people. We got all of these issues that we live out moment by moment, day by day, and most of that isn't based on the current reality. It's based on the past junk that we're still toting around years and decades after somebody hurt us. And so if we're talking about being free, if we're talking about 2019 actually being a different story than 2018 and all the years before it, we got to stop and look at how much am I carrying around? And could it be possibly the moment to let it go? What would my life look like if I wasn't burdened by all of this stuff I'm carrying around? 
You know, whenever we get to talk to these issues about um, mental health and mental awareness and, and our ability to, to think clearly and, and understand and distinguish what, what patterns, those self-destructive patterns that we've got ourselves locked into, I'm always, I'm always cautious. I've heard some bad pseudo-psychology from the pulpit along the way. And, and I think the Bible gives us ultimate wisdom and truth. But I, I think it's also important to understand that we are human. And God has given us the gift of science and discovery and people who have spent their lives dedicated to understanding how we are wired and, and this incredible gift that God has given us. What, what, what does it work? How does it work? And, and what are the things that we should fall out for, uh, watch out for? So anytime I'm having these conversations, I always like to bring in the big guns. I don't want to preach above my pay grade. And so I am so grateful that God has given us some incredible gifts in our family. That everything we need is right here in this body of Christ. And so whenever we get into this area and, and we're talking about freeing our minds and we're talking about breaking patterns and, and realizing that there's stuff that we are living out that we don't even know is there. Stuff that, stu stuff that manifests itself from our childhood that is still happening in our marriages and on our jobs. It's still right there and we don't, it's so close to us we don't even see it anymore. Whenever we get into this area, I always want to lean on those who not only know God, but know how the mind works. And so one of the greatest gifts that, um, that we have in our church is, is Dr. Craig Adams. And I'm so, I'm so thankful for this brother. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for his knowledge and his wisdom, but more than that, I'm thankful that he is one who not only understands the science, but knows how to root that science in the word of God. And so I've asked him to come up. If I could get a wireless mic. Oh, I'll grab one. Um, if, if, um, I've asked him to come up and join me this morning, because um, I don't want to say nothing crazy. <laughs> Um, he's actually got some eye issues, and so I, I keep forgetting. You can come over this way a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to sit in the shade a little bit um, on purpose. Um, and actually, that's part of what he's going to talk about in a little bit. But I, I wanted to give him some space. We talked earlier this week, and he was sharing just some incredible insights about the struggles that we have getting free in our minds. And... And I almost ripped it off and acted like I made it up, but I thought that'd be wrong. <laughs> so I thought I'd just have, I th <laughs> I thought I'd just have him come up and, and share some of the, the incredible wisdom that he shared with me about how do we actually live out this promise of God. There was, there was something in that scripture that said, those who believe in God receive freedom. And if Jesus said it, then it's available to us. But how do we get a hold of it? How, 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 do, we, how do we see what's blocking it? How do, we, how do we manifest it in our lives? And so I wanted Dr. Craig to just share some insights and reflections on he, what he knows about mental freedom. Dr. Craig. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I always say it's hard after he builds you up. You know where to go but down. But we'll, we'll do this. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to talk about actually... Um, most of it comes from a book my ophthalmologist, the Kaiser ophthalmologist gave me. Um, I've been seen by him for 19 years. And I saw him for perhaps my last time because he's retiring in December. And he asked me if I'd read the book Awareness by Anthony DeMello. I told him I'd heard of the book, but I'd never read it. Um, he says, well, he, he wants me to read the book because he, he says the book the author reminds me so much of you. Now, I'm used to analyzing and tripping off of folks. It trips me out when I realize I'm being peeped. But um, the next day, there was a thump on the door. I thought one of the crows in the area had lost his GPS device or something. I go open the door, and, and, and the doctor had Amazoned me <laughs> the book. So I read it, and it did trip me out. <laughs> um, we dovetail in our beliefs as to psychologically what happens to us. Now he believes, uh, Mr. DeMello believes that all of us are dealing with what he called early programming. 
And this early programming is something you'll be battling for the rest of your life. I, I call it needs and then the power struggles from the needs that you put in order. Now he hit three primary areas that from birth you are programmed and will have to fight if you want to find your humanness. And the first one is we are programmed to seek acceptance. Secondly, we are programmed to try to achieve or accomplish things. And thirdly, we are programmed to try to acquire things. And if we don't receive acceptance, then we begin to mentally feel upset. If we set guidelines for ourselves, we're, oh, by this age, I should have achieved this or accomplished that. I should have that house on the hill. I should have this career. We become mentally entrapped. And of course, if I don't have uh, that car I deserve or my kids don't have the Nikes that they're looking for, they get upset. That is being caught up in the expectations and the norms of this world corrupt, fallen world. Now, we're told this from the beginning. The Bible tells you don't, don't love the things of this world. We'll quote it. We'll throw it at each other. We'll even use it when it's convenient, when someone's asking us or something that we don't want to come up with. But it's one thing to intellectually know these things. It's another thing to experience them. I always tell people the majority of our psychological duress our emotional upsetness is the result of wearing other people's issues. Mm, that's so good. Say, say, that, say that one more time. That the majority so of the psychological duress we go through is the result of wearing other people's issues. We've got enough issues of our own. When we start wearing other people's issues, we start getting overwhelmed. Mm. But society, your family, the norms try to get you in a category or a box so you don't feel comfortable if you don't fit into this situation. And you're losing your humanness through that process. Now, the goal, the goal is to become very aware of the programming so that you can begin to kick it to the curb. The goal is to understand what is getting me mentally upset because you're surrendering your mental freedom to the powers that aren't, but you're giving. <laughs> and awareness of, I'm focusing on the world, not God. So if you want to be content, you cannot follow the expectations of the norm. We read these scriptures and we, we read them over and over and I'm glad we're going through the body, mind and spirit um, concept. Today we're going to read them mindfully because they pertain in all areas. And the first scripture is Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Now, this is the King James. No, that's not the King James up there, but I'll read it. Not that I speak in respect of want. This is Paul talking. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therefore to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, well, we'll quote that verse, we'll do, throw it at folks. <laughs> but if you don't apply it, you will not be at peace in your mind you will wonder why you're staying agitated and upset. So what's the cure? DeMello says the cure is to learn to be comfortable in your aloneness. Huh. Huh. If you are not going to fit in with the world, you have to learn to be comfortable in your aloneness. Don't confuse aloneness with loneliness. Huh. Uh -huh. Loneliness is that feeling that's coming as a result of looking at the world but if you're comfortable in your aloneness, you aren't alone. It's you and God. If you stay focused on Christ, you're with the majority. <laughs> but the world will try to make you feel rejected and kicked to the curb if you don't compromise and bend to what they want you to do. And you will not have peace of mind. 
Side note, I was reading what he said and he threw something out there that caught me by surprise. We have emotions just like God has emotions because he created us in his image. One of those that we jump out with quite frequently is anger. He pointed out that any time we are angry, it's actually a secondary emotion. The primary emotion is fear. Uh. And you need to know what it is you're fearful of because you're falling into the pattern of the norm. So if you're fearful of not being accepted, you will be angry if you feel you weren't invited to that party. <laughs> if you're fearful of not having accomplished or achieved what you should have by this age or by this part of your career or where your walk in life, then you will be angry when you don't get the promotion or you don't get the certificate or you don't get the degree or you don't get whatever it is that you think you should have accomplished by now. If you're fearful of not acquiring what you think you should have by now, or someone's going to take advantage of you and take what you believe you've earned and deserved, then you will be angry. So anger is just actually your fear. You need to get in touch with mm -hmm. what of these worldly situations you're getting caught up in. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, looking mindfully at, at, uh, at the scriptures, the cure in getting comfortable with this aloneness means the world is going to see you as a fool. You're going to be seen as foolish. You're going to be seen as stupid. You're going to be seen as not fitting in, bizarre. I like the word peculiar for myself, but others don't look at it in that amicable way. Now, we're told in the scriptures, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19a. I to stroll through my iPad. <laughs> Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Huh. So you got to be willing to stand alone, stand with God, and look like a fool to those that are going to be judging you. Huh. And if you do it frequently enough, you can laugh at the judges. If you aren't incorporating this and you're only taking it in intellectually, you're going to be mentally upset, irritated, feel rejected, down, depressed, whatever word you want to put on it, you're going to feel that way because you focused your eyes on the wrong judging group. Uh, wow. Then, how do you do this on a regular basis? The scriptures tell you. Mindfully, you win by surrendering. You win by surrendering, not to your enemy. You surrender to God's will. And then you will have the peace of mind that you claim that you want. Or put another way that goes throughout the New Testament, you have to be comfortable being willing to die huh. in order to live. Huh. You have to be willing to die in self. You have to be willing to die to the world in order to have a free mind a peace of mind and live. The one of the scriptures, there are plenty I have on that. But it's one we quote all the time, and I want you to look at this mindfully this time, not physically, not spiritually. This is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer than the one we throw around and don't think about. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. You've got to think of that mentally. I'm casting away the things that I thought were making me happy. I'm going to find my joy 
through Christ. We talk it. We talk it. throw a little side note in. This society is corrupt. We are fallen in sin. We as humans navigate toward negativity. We love negativity. That's why our media, our TV shows, or the Jerry Springer in us, their reality show in us, and we just suck it up. Now, now, this negativity is just a natural draw to the flesh. Huh. I attended the Bass uh, Conference up in Castro Valley years and years ago, the Bay Area Sunday School Preparation Conference. And it always amazed me when I would attend that the largest class, they would put you in little, depending on your interest areas, put you in little classrooms, but they always had to get the huge auditorium open anytime they were gonna talk about Satan. Now you gone to Sunday school, why are you gonna fill an auditorium <laughs> anytime Satan's gonna be there? But we're just intrigued. The movie um, Bird Box, making hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, but the main concept is, this negative force is, is coming. It's like the end of the world. And this, this negative evil force is coming. And if you, if you look at it, it can then enter your mind. Uh. Now, people are looking at it, listening to other people who have looked at it. Because when you're looking at it, you're thinking, oh, it is so beautiful. Oh, this is the most wonderful thing I've seen. Oh, this is marvelous. But the problem is once you've looked at it, it enters your mind and it begins putting you on a, a, a mission of self-destruction uh. so that you will have committed suicide within minutes <laughs> after looking at this glorious, wonderful thing that the evils have told you is good. Wow. That, that movie's going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. We love that kind of stuff. But if you reverse it to where we're supposed to be, and if you look at Christ and say, now this is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Look at the beauty in this love. Look at this mercy and this grace. Look at this forgiveness. And then you go and give your testimony. Um, you're going to bankrupt if you try to sell that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So what I've quickly given you here is an understanding. If you want freedom of your mind, if you want peace and joy, then you can't just listen to me. Because this is like reading the scriptures. We take in information intellectually. But until you experience it and put it to the test, uh -huh. you can never understand it. Jesus, would, after he spoke, would always say, let those who have ears hear. Because <laughs> you knew most of them weren't getting it. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, you have to walk it in order to experience the peace that I'm talking about. If you're just... Just listening and taking notes, this is just another intellectual discourse and add it to your journal. And you can even read it a week from now and say, oh yeah, that's right, I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you're willing to die, you will live. Amen. Amen. Hold on, brother. Amen. <laughs> Amazing. Um, that was one of the reasons I wanted Dr. Craig to come share, uh, as he was sharing this with me when we talked on the phone. But that's only really half of it. Uh, the other half is because not only does he have this wonderful intellectual knowledge, but his own life is a reflection of a man after God's own heart. And so we were talking, and he's you know helping me try to get my head around these concepts, and and just in passing he shared with me a couple of stories that, that to me are so relevant because again, we understand this idea of dying to self. We understand this idea of surrendering our minds to the mind of Christ, but what does that actually look like? How do we actually live into that? What, 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 is it, what, is it, what does it mean to do that in our day-to-day -day lives? And so he shared with me two stories, again, just kind of in passing and so, uh, in addition to giving us that framework, I wanted him to share uh, one of those stories that talked about how freeing your mind in Christ actually played out in your own life. Okay. I, I did tell him two stories. I told him the one I'm going to tell you, and then I told him one about my wife who isn't here, so I don't dare tell that one. But um, 
But please understand, when I tell this story, it does not mean I'm all that and a bag of chips. I'm struggling as much as all the, the early patriarchs did. I mean, even when they get blown up in the 13th chapter of Hebrews as, as, as great giants of faith, every one of them fell down too. <laughs> but when I do get it right, it might be good to share that part. And on this one, I got most of it right. I, I mentioned that it was my ophthalmologist who gave me the book. This ophthalmologist is the top retinal surgeon in the Kaiser system for Northern California. I didn't know that, but God placed me there. Mm -hmm. It turns out I'd taken my children to the snow, my grandchildren, and caught an ice ball to the side of my temple that detached the retina to my right eye. So I had to go in to uh, see if it could, you know, get fixed. And they said, yeah, we got to do laser surgery on that right eye. And he, he found out in order to do that, you got to get a shot in the eye. I don't do needles in the arm, so that wasn't happening. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a wimp. I own it. <laughs> but he actually did the surgery on the right eye without, without the deep uh, anesthesia, just drops. And he's already published. I don't know if any of you go to the um, ophthalmology clinic in, in, in uh, Union City. But if you get into the back waiting room, they used to have his publications. He's publishing in all these eyeball journals and whatnot off of his research. Big dude. And they put it on the wall, the abstract, so you can read it. Well, he was walking through the clinic looking like Lord Fauntleroy with everything but a cape. People were diving out of his way, and he's all that. And, but I said, I got the top dude here. He's got everything but a general's hat on or whatever. And he actually did the surgery without the anesthesia. Now, yeah, it hurt. It hurt like nothing I ain't felt before. He would stop when my feet went off the, the couch. But when he was done, he was saying, I got to publish this. No one's going to believe you did this surgery without without the anesthesia. He said, that's like filling a deep, deep, deep cavity with no Novocaine. And he said, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he said, but you know, you've been nearsighted for a long time. That's why your retina detached. And people that have been nearsighted, your eyeballs are longer than most. So they, it, they detach fairly easily. So since this eye is pretty much gone, we better make sure do preventative work on your good eye. So let me see, and he looks and he says, yeah, preventatively, I want to go in there and I want to make sure that one's super, super sealed. So he says, come back in a month. And I said, okay. And he says, but, but you got to have, you got to have the injection this time. And I said, well, I did the other one without it. He said, no, but my hands have to be steady. I prayed to God, Lord, should I do this? I prayed for a month. I actually came down because they used to do prayer up here for special needs at the, at the end of the church, and I got my prayer partners. I need you to pray on this, and I ain't getting an answer. None of us got an answer. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go through the deep relaxation like I do my clients, and then allow it to happen. And went through the deep relaxation. Make a long story short, he gave me the injection and missed. And entered all that anesthesia into the eyeball that was supposed to go behind the eyeball into the muscle where the nerve is, and it's toxic. <laughs> so to make a long story short, I'm now blinded in my good eye, <laughs> and I gotta work with the one that's injured. So when he did it, it tore him down. First he wanted to say, oh my God, you must have moved. This has never happened before. And I looked at him and said, yeah, I'll show you right. But um, <laughs> I let it go. And he said, well, I guess you're going to fire me now. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. No way in the world you're getting fired. Because this baby here that needs healing, uh, that, that's your baby. <laughs> you send me to another doctor. I'm just too bad at sets of bad eyes. They don't care about me. But I know you're invested in this one. And he said, you're absolutely right, I am. Here's my cell phone number. Here's my home number. If anything happens, you call me. Don't call Kaiser. I will meet you wherever you are. <laughs> We're going to keep this eye working. And we've had three, three surgeries, clearing the scar tissue and whatnot. And, and he was the excellent doctor that all that pomp and circumstance said he was. He, he got my eyeball seeing again. But he said, I can't believe you're, I can't believe you're not angry with me. And he gave me a blood pressure measurement. He blood pressure measurement. He said, I can tell if you're angry because your blood pressure is going to be up. <laughs> and, I, and my blood pressure was low. 
And he said, you really aren't angry with me. Why is that? And I said, well, number one, because I don't look at behaviors, I look at intent. Now, now this is my failure, this is my flesh. <laughs> this is not part of having that free mind. <laughs> this is judgment. I look at intent. I don't believe you woke up this morning and said, hmm, I'm gonna blind some sucker this morning, I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> so how can I be angry with someone who made a mistake trying to help me? Uh, so huh. he said, okay. I said, that's the first reason. He said, well, what's the second reason? I said, the second reason is because I don't believe in accidents or coincidence. I believe God is in control, and I learned from the book of Job, nothing can happen to me unless he gives his nod of approval. And then I learned from Romans 8, 28, that if something negative happens to me, by my definition, all things work together for the good to those that love the Lord and to the called according to his purpose. So I may not see or understand what it's good for, but he wouldn't have put me through this unless it was for him to somehow glorify himself. Wow. Well, Doc said, I don't know what kind of God you worship. <laughs> and he said, if he needed to blind someone for his glory, I got a whole lot of the folks come through here. I could see getting blinded off of their attitudes. <laughs> Why would he pick you? And I said, I don't know. I don't even question it. That's out of my pay grade. <laughs> so he works with me, he works with me. A year later, I'm noticing the his assistants and the clerks that used to dance and get away from him are now cracking jokes with him and whatnot. And he rolls his chair up to me a year later and he says, you know what? And he says, what? I've really been trying to understand, get a grip on what you told me. Free from what my mother did and what my father did and from the people who let me down. Imagine me free. Imagine Imagine a brand new me basking in the glory of my God. And there's this line that I, I particularly love. It says, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine that God could love someone like me. It's hard to believe that with all I've done and with all I've said, and all the mistakes I've made and all the things that I've gotten in my past, that that truth about freedom really applies to me. I wanna give us just a moment and I'm praying that as you're thinking about 2019, as we're, as we're imagining this best life ever, can we just dream about what it would look like if we were truly free from all the hurts, all the hang-ups, all the disappointments, and free to be what God desires us to be. I want you to just take a moment, shut yourself in right where you are. And our musicians are gonna to minister to us. And if in this moment, you wanna come up and you want some prayer, you want someone to place a hand on you and remind you that you are the apple of God's eye and that the best that God has it for you isn't lying in those bags. It's still in the days to come. Imagine what God could do. I want to leave you with one more thought as we prepare to wrap up our service. Uh, Today is, uh, or this weekend, is Dr. Martin Luther King weekend. Um, and so I wanted to, to give us a thought that might tie in with being free in our minds as we celebrate this holiday. Um, Steve, you can show that, show that slide. Um, I picked that picture of Dr. King because I was, I was thinking about the irony that those of us who are um, sensitive to the, to the s systemic injustices in our country, 
uh, often feel at odds with the American dream. And so I was thinking about this celebration, this holiday, this national holiday and what that means. And, and I was struck by this thought that Dr. King, who was mistreated and disrespected and jailed and marginalized and threatened and all of these things, trying to serve a country that he loved, that didn't really love him back very well. Never turned to hate. Never turned to retribution. Was never spiteful about those that literally spit in his face. And that only happens when your mind has been freed. That this holiday isn't just about the civil rights movement, it's about another example of the Spirit of God using us when we have released the bonds of the mindset of this world to allow the Spirit of God to work through us. And I want to encourage us that the same way it worked through Dr. King, it's available for us today. One of my other heroes is Nelson Mandela, and I, I found this quote that I think, you know, just resonates. He says, you know, we know Nelson Mandela in prison for all these years, came back, became the president. And I love that movie because it talked about the struggle from those who are around him to say, it's now our time for some payback. And, and he didn't do that. He chose unity. He chose reconciliation. And here's this quote. He says, I'm not a saint unless you think of a saint as a sinner who just keeps on trying. See, we're not going to live into this freedom perfectly. We're not going to get it right in our relationships with our children at work. We're not going to do it right all the time. But God knows we can keep on trying to manifest, to, to take hold of the freedom that God promised. And then the last one, if you have been around South Bay for a while, you know that picture. That is a picture of our, of our brother Carl Ray. Um, Amen. Carl faithfully was here at South Bay. His and his lovely wife, Brenda, they've been here. It's such an integral part of our family for years. And if you don't know his story, uh, he, he did a one-man play about an event that I can't even really imagine. He, he literally saw his father killed in front of him on the steps of their house in Mississippi. And he talks about it, talked about it for years, about the anger and the bitterness and the rage that he had towards those men and towards everybody that looked like him. His father was killed by a group of hateful, bigoted racists, and he carried that for years. And then he said, one day God did something in his heart. And it was gone. The hate towards that man who shot his father was gone. I believe he said he even went back to Mississippi and spoke to that man, sat down with that man, forgave that man. But more importantly than that, more importantly than that, that, that particular relationship, he talked about how his whole heart was changed by God. That he didn't carry all of that around and it changed his whole life that is freedom it's not just in the Bible it's not just out there somewhere it's not even just with these great heroes it happens right here in our family that God is breaking the bonds of this world the hurt the pain and he is renewing us saving us transforming us setting the captives free and I pray that we hunger for it and desire it from the depths of our heart, the depths of our soul, and are eager to see what God can do as we live into the best us ever. Amen. Um, Father, we are believing your promises. We are believing that whoever 
is uh, standing in the presence of God, whoever is believing and trusting in you, that he who is in us is greater than anything this world can throw at us, God. So we stand on the promises that we are more than conquerors by Christ Jesus, Father. We, we stand on the power of the resurrecting God who is still doing miracles in our lives, who is healing us, who is restoring us, who is seeing in us far more than we see in ourselves and is calling us to reflect your glory, your majesty, your power. God, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your mercy. We receive your grace. And we pray that you use our lives to distribute your love in a hurting and broken world, God. Take our hands, take our feet, take our mind, take our words, God. Use us for your redeeming power that by our lives and our faithfulness, our God may be seen, our God may be praised. Father, we will give you all the glory for the good things that you are doing in us and through us. May everyone within the sound of my voice, God, receive the power of the Spirit, the freedom in Christ, and the joy of the Lord. May your light shine through us as we leave this place, but never your presence. We give you the best of us, God. Use us for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To me, the best gift that we have is our family. I want us to hug somebody, give somebody a handshake. Visitors, I'd love to uh, get a chance to meet you and greet you. Please stay around for prayer TNT for our offering. Our hosts are going to be by the back. Just put it in the uh, baskets as we leave. Have a Jesus week, family. God bless you and praise you.